Hi guys! I know this isn't quite as good as having me in class with you, um, but we are going to attempt to have our first ever Miss Bykowski is out, so she is using Explain Everything to teach us just a little bit of background about Things Fall Apart, which is the novel we are going to be reading by Chinua Achebe. Later this week, you're going to begin work on your research project that is going to help us dive into various aspects of Nigerian culture and Nigerian life, with a particular focus on the Igbo tribe. Why focus on the Igbo? Because Things Fall Apart takes place in several Igbo villages, and our main characters are members of the Igbo tribe. Nigeria has a very complex and rich history, um, and as you begin researching little bits and pieces about Nigerian life, I think it'll be really helpful for you to have a broad overview of Nigerian history. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. If you just listen along, there are a couple of worksheets and activities that go along with this. Um, along with this lesson, I'll cue you in when you need to be referring to them. Uh, but for the most part, I'd just like you to listen along. There's no need to take any advanced notes. Uh, you'll be listening to this and you'll have access to this later on. And I'm sure we'll be reviewing this a little bit when I return from retreat. The first thing I want to do with you today um, is actually have a little bit of story time. If I were in the classroom, I would turn off the lights and invite you to put your heads down or sit on the floor or assume any position that was very comfortable for you. But since I'm not there, try and stay in your desks. Um, uh, the sub knows that you're going to be listening to a story for a brief moment, so totally fine if you put your heads down if you're listening, especially if you're listening with headphones. Just as a heads up, um, once I'm done narrating this folk tale to you, because we are going to be listening to a folk tale, um, I'm going to be asking you to complete the front page of the yellow worksheet that says the flute. So feel free to listen to this over and over again if you need to. You can also refer to the portal uh, under the Things Fall Apart folder, and then the folktales subfolder, you'll find a PDF version of this folktale that I'm about to recount to you. The flute is actually an Igbo folktale that's been passed down for hundreds of years through hundreds of generations. It was written down in the form I'm reading to you today in 1977 by Chinua Achebe. Now, this is an Igbo folktale, but there's a very high probability and in all events, a very high likelihood that a version of this story exists in other Nigerian tribes and indeed in other African tribes and cultures across the continent. You may even see some similarities to other folk tales that you've heard from other parts of the world. So here we go. The Flute, an Igbo folk tale. A man took his family of two wives the senior wife who had many children, and the other wife who had just the one son, to work on their distant farm at the border of the human and spirit lands. They were always careful to return home well before nightfall, because at night was when the spirits came out to tend their own crop of yams, yams being particularly important to this particular tribe. One night, upon returning home, the only son of the younger wife found that he had forgotten his flute in the fields. This wasn't just any flute. It was a flute he had made with his own hands, and he was absolutely determined to retrieve it, in spite of his parents' desperate pleas to stay home. When the boy reached the farm, the spirits were indeed out and about, tending to their crop of yams. Their leader spoke, Shah, human boy, who sent you here? What are you looking for? You foolish fly that follows the corpse into the ground. Did nobody tell you that we are abroad at this time? The boy explained that he had returned simply to pick up his flute, the flute that he had made with his own hands. The spirit leader asked if he would know this flute when he saw it, and the boy answered yes. The spirit then produced a golden flute, which the boy rejected. The spirit leader then produced a second shining flute, a flute that shined like diamonds, 
which the boy also rejected. Finally, the spirit leader showed the boy an old beaten bamboo flute, which the boy claimed as his very own. When the boy rejected the golden flute and the shining flute and accepted the bamboo flute, the spirits were pleased and offered the boy a choice between two pots. The boy chose the smaller pot, which proved to provide food and riches for his family for many years to come. When the young boy returned home, the senior wife was very jealous of all of his rewards. So she took her eldest son and his flute to the yam farm on the edge of the human and spirit lands and contrived for the flute of her eldest son to be left there. Later that night, she sent her eldest son to retrieve the flute from the spirits. But when the eldest son of the senior wife met the spirits, he chose the golden flute when it was offered to him. Then, when the spirits gave him the choice of jars, large and small, he chose the large jar. Proud, he brought the pot back to his mother, who securely locked them in their hut before attempting to open the jar. Immediately upon opening it, leprosy, smallpox, yaws, and worse infectious diseases without names, and every evil and abomination filled the hut and killed the woman and all her children. The next morning, upon hearing no noise from the hut, the father raced to open the door, and he only just managed to close it before any of those unnamed evils entered the world. The end. So, even though this story was written down in the form of a children's book by Chinua Achebe in 1977, it's a story that has lasted the test of time and has been passed down through various generations of Igbo tribes members and is still told today. Please take this time to pause the video um, and answer the questions that are on the yellow sheet, the flute. These questions ask you to examine the lessons learned and the information explained and passed down through this folktale. It's certainly not the only Igbo folktale, and it's certainly not the only version of the story, but it certainly reveals a great deal of information to us. And having that information will help inform your further study of Nigeria and our conversations about things fall apart. Once you have completed the questions on the yellow page, the flute, you can continue listening to our fabulous video presentation. We're going to switch gears from folk tales now and spend a little bit of time discussing on a very high level, this is a brief overview, uh, the history of the Nigerian state. The first thing to do, and perhaps the most helpful thing to do, is try to locate Nigeria on a map of the African continent. Perhaps you're very well versed with Africa, and you already know where Nigeria sits. But if you don't, let's take a look. Nigeria is here, sort of in the middle of the country, at least in terms of north to south. And you can see that it is bordered on one side by the South Atlantic Ocean, and on other sides by the countries of Benin, Niger, a little bit of Chad, and Cameroon. Now, it's particularly worthwhile to note Nigeria's place on the African coast. Why? Because of its history with the slave trade. Anything to the left of the line, for the most part, was involved in the slave trade. Because, think about it, you have all of these European nations, seafaring European nations, England, um, Germany to a certain extent, France, Spain, Portugal, um, the Dutch through the Dutch East India Trading Company, all of these nations are exploring Africa and India and Asia Minor via sea routes. And the slave trade really, really picked up when all of these nations started coming to Africa 
through the Atlantic Ocean and landing on the coasts. It's worth noting, and you can probably see, although it is kind of small, there are a number of rivers running through Nigeria, which actually um, encouraged the tribal dependency on agriculture. I know it sounds kind of funny to think about, but the yam, or what you might know as the sweet potato, is actually a staple crop in Nigeria, and it features prominently in the novel Things Fall Apart. Just a quick little note about... Uh, ancient Nigerian history. Think back to the map we were just looking at. Nigeria kind of occupies this space right here. Um, and the Nigerian nation state, as we know it today, grew out of the Benin and Songhai empires many, 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 many years ago. Um, that doesn't feature too much in the novel, but I thought it might be worth letting you know. As European nations started venturing farther and farther abroad and becoming more adventurous, in their desire to seek out um, more interesting natural resources and to make more money, frankly, um, the slave trade expanded significantly in the 15th century. And that slave trade and the expansion of the slave trade deeply impacted not only African history, but also Nigerian history. Acknowledgement and recognition of the slave trade's role, especially in West African history, is particularly important. But by the time Things Fall Apart takes place, slavery had already been abolished. It's worth noting that the area that Nigeria occupies was at once occupied by the Portuguese and, for a small time, the Germans and the French and the Dutch, but it ended up in the hands of the British. And in the 1830s, the United Kingdom completely abolished slavery in every single one of its colonies. Just at the turn of the 20th century, in 1901, Nigeria, or the area that is now Nigeria, became a British protectorate. So originally it was not colonized, it was a number of tribes existing, sometimes peacefully, sometimes not so peacefully with one another. Um, then, during the colonial period, Nigeria became a colony. Um, it went by a couple of different names, but it ended up being called Nigeria. And then in 1901, it became a little bit more than a colony, but not quite an independent nation state. Independence for Nigeria didn't come about until 1960, which is just roughly 55 years ago, a short amount of time in the grand scheme of human existence. Now, it's worth noting that Things Fall Apart was written by Achebe in 1958, during the height of Nigerian nationalism. In spite of the fact that there are multiple um, ethnicities and tribes and cultures and religions and languages in this one nation state, the entire group of humans that were involved in Nigeria at the time were excited for the idea of a state free from British rule. The very diversity that helped to fuel the movement for independence, however, led to a number of tensions in the modern day. I mean... Think about it. You have hundreds and hundreds of tribes across this one continent. It's not as though you can turn to hundreds of ethnic groups and say, okay, well, we're going to colonize you now, so play nice, even though you don't understand each other and in some cases might not even be able to communicate with one another. The map in front of you is a map from 1707. It's pre-colonial Africa. Now, it's important to note that this is a map drawn by a European. This, of course, means that the map itself has Western bias. This map, though it is very hard to read, was published in 1909, and it is a map of colonial Africa. You'll notice that there's absolutely no way that what's represented on this map here can accurately and fully represent the number of tribes and cultures that exist on the African continent. It is worth noting, however, that the political boundaries of Nigeria that we know today are starting to take shape in the early 20th century. This is a map from 1985, and the geopolitical borders represented here almost reflect the geopolitical borders of today. There are some notable differences, particularly here in Sudan. South Sudan is now its own legitimate sovereign nation. But for the most part, you can look at this map as representative of Africa after a number of the independence movements of the mid to late 
20th century. And for our purposes, it's worth noting that the borders of Nigeria haven't changed much since then. On the right of your screen, you see the Nigerian flag, one flag for one nation state. But this particular nation is plagued by a number of striking challenges. Not in the least, the multiple indigenous societies that I've kept mentioning this entire presentation. Furthermore, it's worth noting that over the last 55 years, since Nigeria attained its independence from the United Kingdom, the country has still been exploited by European nations, a trend that began many hundreds of years ago and, to some degree, still kind of exists today. The yoke of imperial occupation is not entirely gone from modern Nigeria. The ethnic tensions and the religious tensions and the linguistic tensions that exist in this nation exist in large part because a Western European power came in and said, all right, you hundreds of societies, you're going to act as one now. And this led to a drive for independence in the 1960s, in spite of the fact that still within the nation state, there are a number of separate groups. Modern Nigeria is also plagued by the challenges of creating post-colonial policies in a new fledgling nation. And this is a problem that exists today. As I said before, 55 years is not a long time to be an independent country. In order to form policies and laws that apply to every tribal and ethnic group in the country is a huge and very challenging responsibility. Let's take a slightly closer look at some of these tensions that exist in the modern day. A number of them have to do with, as I've mentioned, ethnicity. The four primary ethnic groups in Nigeria today are the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Hausa, and the Fulani, among many, many others. And each one of these tribes, for the most part, has its own language, its own wedding customs, its own religious beliefs, um, its own rites of passage. The challenges presented by the multiplicity of ethnicities and tribes and societies and cultures in Nigeria are exacerbated by the variety of religions and the diversity of religions in Nigeria. As you can see from this lovely little pie chart, about 50% of the nation today is Muslim, 40% claim to be Christian, and about 10% still adhere to indigenous uh, tribal faiths. Um, the tribal faiths actually that are portrayed beautifully in Things Fall Apart. And the final piece that's kind of contributing to the modern day tensions in this nation has to do with language. There are over 515 languages listed as being associated with the country of Nigeria. And 505 of those 515 are considered living languages. Just to illustrate for you, Latin, which is still used fairly widely in various contexts, is considered a dead language. This one nation has over 500 living languages, meaning they are spoken and used today in regular life. Um, the map on the right of your screen illustrates a little bit um, how many languages there are in the nation. This certainly is not an exhaustive list. Even though there are a number of languages spoken in Nigeria, it's important to know that the only official language of the country is English, which is kind of one, a hangover from its imperial days as a colony of England, um, but it's also a testament to the fact that there is no other one language that can unite all of these different peoples. Chinua Achebe writes things fall apart in English, not because he doesn't know his native Igbo, but he uses English to try and illustrate to the Western reader African society, African culture, particularly Nigerian Igbo society and culture. And we'll talk a little bit more about how Chinua Achebe uses the English language to that effect as we continue on with our study of the novel. That's pretty much all I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, you'll find out more as you engage in research for your Things Fall Apart research project. I just want to leave you with something that Chinua Achebe himself said about you know, imperialism and Nigeria and its effect on the country and on the people. In front of you, you have a truncated version of this quotation. I'm going to read the extended one, so feel free to follow along or just listen quietly. 
These are Chinua Achebe's own words. The society of Mofia, in the village in Things Fall Apart, was totally disrupted by the coming of the European government, missionary Christianity, and so on. That was not a temporary disturbance. It was a once-and-for-all alteration of their society. To give you the example of Nigeria, where the novel is set, the Igbo people had organized themselves in small units, in small towns and villages, each self-governed. With the coming of the British, Igbo land as a whole was incorporated into a totally different polity to be called Nigeria, with a whole lot of other people with whom the Igbo people had not had direct contact before. The result of that was not something from which you could recover, really. You had to learn a totally new reality and accommodate yourself to the demands of this new reality, which is the state called Nigeria. Various nationalities, each of which had its own independent life, were forced by the British to live with people of different customs and habits and priorities and religions. And then, at independence, 50 years later, they were suddenly on their own again. They began all over again to learn the rules of independence. The problems that Nigeria is having today could be seen as resulting from this effort that was initiated by colonial rule to create a new nation. Chinua Achebe said this in an interview, uh, an African voice, in 2002. Um, and I think it nicely sums up why it's important to understand, you know, the background of this nation and of the tribe that we're going to be reading about with this novel. Um, so with that said, I would love for you to turn to the back side of your yellow worksheet. Um, I believe it says Nigerian cultures. If you could just take a second, follow the instructions. There are three questions I'd love you to answer. Um, and then... The substitute teacher, depending on where you all are, should have information for you regarding your research project, which you can get started on for the rest of class. If you choose not to work on the research project, you're also welcome to work on your creative writing. Thanks for listening.